Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about our military service members, veterans, and their families, and providing support for their substance use and mental health problems. Joining us in our panel today are Jennifer Crane, Operation Enduring Freedom Veteran, Outreach Assistant, Given Hour, Coatesville, Pennsylvania. Dr. Barbara Cahoon, Deputy Director, Government Relations, National Military Family Association, Washington, D.C. Dr. Mike Haney, Executive Director and Founder, Institute for Veterans and Military Families, Syracuse, New York. A. Catherine Power, SAMHSA Strategic Initiative Lead for Military Families and Regional Administrator, Region 1, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Boston, Massachusetts. Catherine, there's approximately 2.3 million active military uh, men and women and about 22 million vets. Um, talk to us a little bit about why military families are important to our national security. Well, I think one of the most important reasons that we're paying attention to the military family is because we know that this particular conflict is taking a major toll on military service members and their families. I think it's Mrs. Obama who uses the statistic saying that 1% of the people are doing 100% of the fighting. And I think that that statement really resonates with all of us across the United States who really want to understand and help um, the military family members who have served in the defense of our country to come back into their communities and to really be fully integrated and fully reintegrated into their communities. And I think that we all carry a sense of ownership and a sense of responsibility about that community. And no longer are military families isolated and no longer should people who have served in the military only be either in military communities. We really have to embrace them as a national community in our neighborhoods, in our schools. And in that way, I think we show our respect for the work that they've done. And in fact, we want to embrace and be joyful about their service and at the same time help them become the civilian members as they leave the military, the civilian members of the community that they can. I think it's all part of our national defense. It's all part of our national security. Excellent. Barbara, um, and, and broaden for us the, the definition of what a military family is. In the past, we looked at military families as, as being the spouse of the active duty military um, service member and their families, but now it's so much more broader. I mean, because we have a lot of our service members, both active duty and reserve component are single, or about 50 percent. And so therefore, we're looking at mom, dad, stepmom, stepdad, um, siblings that are involved as well. And um, we also have communities that also are very in, um, engaged. I mean, when their service member or their guardsman or reservist goes off um, to Iraq or Afghanistan, we found the community is wanting to be very um, involved as well, as Catherine um, had mentioned. So we consider them, too, as far as being part of the broader family that um, takes care of our families. A lot of parents are being more and more engaged. I mean, one of the things that we hear is how engaged they are, especially with our wounded, ill, and injured. So um, our family, a definition of family has really expanded. And traditionally, we thought of even the wife, the husband, the children, and now it really goes, it, it's more complex than that for the immediate family of, of the military uh, service member, correct? Oh, de definitely, because we have partners, um, those that are together, um, you know, not necessarily in, in marriage, but are, are living together. And of course, now with the passage of uh, Don't Ask and Don't Tell, we have that particular um, partner going on um, as well. And so they are also embraced as far as being part of the, uh, the family as well. And even the Veterans Administration, I think, Barbara, is looking very closely at their definition of family, even now, and trying to determine what is the best way to capture those individuals who are, who are in a person's life, who have an emotional attachment, and who are so important for their support. Yeah, and, I, and I think the, the unique circumstance of the, of the, 
the past decade at war in terms of the nature of the conflicts has also sort of really pushed that, that issue to the forefront with regard to military members um, are often married to other military members. So when you have um, multiple deployments, sometimes both parents deployed, um, really the definition of who is assuming a lot of these family roles is changing. Um, it can be other members of the community. Um, very often it's, it's uh, children um, that are assuming a lot of uh, parental responsibilities, if you will, um, in the face of both parents being deployed or, or one parent being deployed. Um, so I think the nature of these conflicts has also really pushed the boundaries of how we define what a fam military family is. So Jen, let's start talking about, given those parameters, what happens, what are the dynamics that happens in that military family and what do we need to begin to look out for? Um, it's a very isolating feeling for not only the service member but also for the family. And in my case, I'm not only a veteran, but my brother's also a veteran, so I got to be on both ends of the spectrum. And also, I'm married now, and my husband was not with me when I deployed. We were just friends, but he is actually getting to feel the repercussions of my deployment, even though we weren't together when I was overseas. So um, the span is huge. You know, it goes not only from the people that you were with and were a part of your life then, but then it's the aftermath and the people that are with you years later. So we need to not, you know, forget about that as well. Um, for me, when I was deployed, you know, the being taken away from the family aspect and being part of another part of my life was, uh, like I said, isolating. Very, very isolating. You feel kind of very lost, but you have your military family to fall back on. So in, in some way, it was actually easier for me because I had those people that loved and supported me and that I knew that my life depended on. My family, on the other hand, spent, you know, every minute of every day wondering where I was, what I was doing, and if I was okay. So it's um, extremely stressful so during the deployment, but the aftermath of it is probably the hardest part. You mean when the person comes back, actually. And, and what does a member, Catherine, experience once they come back? Could they have some issues related to post-traumatic stress, depression, traumatic brain injury, or all of the above? Well, I think in the case of the uh, current conflict, and certainly over the last uh, 10 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, anyone who has been in theater uh, has experienced, I'm sure, some level of trauma. I mean, I don't think any military member could be deployed and in that environment and not experience some level of trauma. Uh, and so from our perspective, we begin to take a look at that's a, a realistic issue and everyone I think needs to face that. Personally, the service members of course are facing it, but the families and the communities need to be ready to understand what that means. So the universality of trauma I think is a very important part of understanding uh, what this community might have in, what, uh, in terms of their conditions. But in addition to the fact that they're in trauma or they've been exposed to combat, they've also been exposed to uh, other forms of violence or have witnessed violence in ways that are really uh, not normal. I mean, it's a very abnormal situation. So therefore, how each individual adjusts to that, to being in combat, to being in a warrior environment is very unique individually. Certainly the military trains people to be prepared for that. Certainly I think military service members are tremendously resilient. They have very strong resiliency skills. And uh, frankly, that's why they're in the military because they have good resiliency skills. But given the nature of this conflict and particularly the nature of multiple deployments, they take their toll. They take their toll emotionally, they take their toll behaviorally, and it's very difficult then to come back into the civilian community to readjust because there's really now what mm -hmm. is known as a new normal. And Mike, what does a family need to look for? Because oftentimes the symptoms that the military service member might feel are not visible to the family, are not visible to individuals who may even be co conducting an assessment of their situation. Yeah, I, th this is a really complex issue because I think not only, you know, we talked about experiencing trauma in the context of war, but I think an issue that is, that is underappreciated in the context of the challenges facing um, many of our veterans is this idea of transitioning from a military life to a civilian life. Uh, the military is really good at um, 
using artifacts, symbols, ceremonies, things like that to sort of intertwine my individual identity with that of being a military member. I am a Marine. You know, I had a, uh, to illustrate the point, um, you know, a young Marine who uh, was, was wounded and then because of his injuries had to transition out of the military. And, and in talking to him about that transition, he said, you know, one of the things that, was, that I really struggled with is before, while I was in the Marine Corps, I would introduce myself to people, you know, my name's John, I'm a Marine. And he said, all of a sudden I realized at this moment in time that I'm not a Marine anymore. And he said, I stopped introducing myself to people because I didn't know what to say, because I didn't know how to define who I was. So his and entire identity. Was wrapped up in being a Marine or being a Ranger or whatever it is. And I think this, it really is a discontinuous transition from military life to civilian life. And um, as a consequence of that, that you really do feel um, isolated. You want to withdraw. Um, not so much because you know you you don't want social interaction but you're not exactly sure where you fit for a period of time and I I think um, that is a that is a challenge that we don't talk about enough and when we come back I want to be able to talk to Jen because you've had experiences uh, that were quite unique when you returned and we're going to start talking a little bit about substance use and uh, some mental health issues we'll be right back SAMHSA has a strategic initiative specifically focused on military families. The reason for that is that at this point in history, we have more people and their families who are either in deployment currently or who are in National Guard or reserves or who are veterans than ever before. And we know more and more these days about what that toll is, what that takes on the individual and on their families. We know that they struggle with um, separation, they struggle, struggle with constant movement, and they just struggle with extra pressures. And um, because of what happens to people in deployment sometimes, they have uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, or they have substance abuse issues, or their family members and children struggle with uh, their schoolwork, and lots of issues going on. We need to support those families. They need our help uh, with their behavioral health issues, but frankly, they just need our help to support them uh, because they've supported us. One of the uh, key issues associated with returning veterans' families is that the families need to understand something about the return, re returning veterans' experience, but also their own experience. That veteran has been away, they've worried, they've been concerned, they've had to deal with some of the day-to-day uh, -day issues of reality without uh, the father or the mother or the spouse. Uh, being around, and then when the veteran returns, uh, there is this, uh, shall we say, rosy expectation that everything is going to go back to normal right away, and that often does not happen. So the family needs to be prepared to adjust to the returning veteran's presence, but also to, to adjust to their own emotional re reaction to having the veteran uh, back in the household and dealing with some of the tensions that the veteran may be experiencing, but they they may be experiencing also. Uh, I'd like to think that our nation owes an obligation to the veteran, but also our nation also owes an obligation to the family members because they both serve this nation in, in times of war. And we need to make it clear to the family that we recognize that uh, uh, that, that sacrifice that they've made it has been a major sacrifice and that that transition back to uh, normal, as it were, and put quotes around the word normal, that transition back to a more harmonious uh, working family relationship may take some time. I felt broken. I needed help for my addiction and depression, and help was there. I found support as I rebuilt my life, piece by piece. With the help of my family and recovery support community, I'm rebuilding my life. And through recovery, I am whole again. Join, Join the Voices for Recovery. recovery. It's, it's worth, worth it. it. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.
I think it's important to, pi to point out how many vets are going through substance abuse uh, problems and a lot of that is being due to the depression, the anxiety, the post-traumatic, the TBI, uh, you know, the loss of limbs, all the things that we've seen and done while we were overseas. Uh, it's important for vets and, and their families to know that they're not alone, that this is more common than we like to admit, and that the help is out there. All you have to do is reach out and realize that you're worth it. Jen, you previously were alluding to some of the issues that you had upon your return from, from your deployment. Do you want to cover some of those for our audience? Uh, absolutely. Uh, first, I want to go back to what Mike was saying. He's talking about, you know, that kind of loss of identity. And that was a huge factor for myself and for my brother and many other veterans I've met as to what we go through when we come home because all of a sudden, you're not a soldier, you're put back in the civilian environment where not only you don't understand where you belong, but society doesn't understand where you belong either. So you, it, the dynamic is very interesting when you're watching it. It kind of feels like you're in a bubble all by yourself and you don't really know where you belong. When I came home from overseas, I was very sick. Uh, that was the first thing. I lost a ton of weight while I was deployed from dehydration and uh, bad nutrition and everything else. Just didn't really have the time for it, quite frankly. And I came home and I had already begun to have nightmares and flashbacks and I had already isolated myself from my family. I began that process actually while I was deployed. So when I walked in the door and my family saw me, everybody was happy and crying and I was just very numb. I, I didn't feel anything. I did not want to be there. I wanted to be back overseas. That was where I felt I belonged. And I didn't know, I no longer belonged in my own life back in the United States. So I very quickly t decided that I was going to figure out a way to get rid of the nightmares. I was going to try to figure out where where I fit in this you know thing called family. And I started using drugs. I ended up homeless. I did that on and off for about three years. I finally ended up at the, my local VA where I went to their substance abuse program. I abused. Um, anything that was like amphetamine-like, so cocaine, methamphetamines, you, you name it, I pretty much did it. Uh, anything to kind of get rid of what I was feeling. I was also a self-mutilator. Uh, mm. It allowed me to feel some kind of emotion, some kind of uh, pain, I guess. You know, it was the inward pain that I couldn't express. I was able to do outwardly. And I eventually ended up in a substance abuse program. I then found out I had chronic post-traumatic stress disorder. I ended up in the program for that. And five weeks into my program, I left the program and I started using again. I ended up uh, getting involved in solicitation. I was homeless, again, living out of my car. And, and how do you come out of that? How do uh, you? It was, it, it was amazing, actually. I, uh, right after that period of time, it was only about three months, and I ended up getting arrested. And I said, I'm done. I was JAG Corps in the military. I, was, I wanted no part of being on the wrong side of the law. And I said, I'm going to get my life together. So I did. I went through a drug court program. I got mm -hmm. counseling. I got on the right meds. I did what I needed to do. And I started talking about it and started really feeling what I had been through. And I eventually just started to get better with time. Very good. Barbara, what is there that needs to happen when a family, when a, when a military um, service member goes and gets deployed? How should we be working with the families in order to continuously provide support? And what type of support need to be there in order for the military member upon return to be able to find a better environment to be integrated, as Mike uh, mentioned earlier? The, the family needs to be prepared right from the get-go, before the deployment actually even happens. As far as the family getting together, and that includes the service member who's forward deploying, irregardless if it's the husband or a brother, as far as getting together to talk about you know what's coming up. A lot of the services have programs as far as for families to go to, a pre-deployment briefing. There's a lot of information that's available through the Department of Defense as far as on the websites for families as far as to go to as well. There's military one source as far as programs. So families need to get prepared before the deployment happens, get their wills in order, medical power of attorneys, um, who's gonna pay their bills while they're gone, those types of things. If I rent a home or a mortgage, if I'm single, who's gonna be taking care of all of that while I'm gone? 
Then once the service member for deploys, then the families also need support, not only as far as through the military, but from their communities um, as well. As Catherine had mentioned before, I mean, we do live out in the communities. In fact, 85 percent um, of our families actually um, attend public schools and 65 percent actually live out into the communities. And so we're our neighbor, you know, we are your neighbor. Um, and so therefore, we're, that we need support from the communities as well. And if I'm not near a military installation, so therefore I don't have those types of services, then it's even more important as far as to make sure that I'm accessing what's available to me either online or within my local community. And just before they come back, some of the services will actually provide um, um, a pre-return, like a reintegration type program. And it's very important for families to go to that as well and engage. And family, as we discussed before, is a fairly broad definition. And so everyone who has a touch point with a service member who's coming back needs to be engaged with those types of program. Military One Source is a Department of Defense program and it is available for parents if they want to get involved. Now, once they come back, it's also important for programs to be available at that particular point in time. And the Guard and Reserve are doing yellow ribbon programs. And again, families should be involved with that as well. And they're taught signs and symptoms, what to look for if someone's having um, you know, traumatic brain injury or showing um, post-traumatic stress, and where to go as far as for help, and, where to, um, and what sort of resources are available. The VA even offers a program called Coaching Into Care, which is available as far as for families to then reach out to them and they'll help them, guide them, assist them in getting the veteran now um, into care as far as th through the VA. So you need um, a continuum of support for families, not only through the Department of Defense, but also as far as through um, the communities as well. And now the Department of Veterans Affairs is getting very involved in helping families through their vet centers. So there's a lot of areas which families can go to, but sometimes they don't know what they don't know. And there's so much mm -hmm. out there they just don't know where um, um, to go. Well, and, and that was the piece that was missing for me when I came home. And we have those pieces now. Like my brother, he has done phenomenally because of we had the information, we had all the programs available to us that weren't available before. What so, programs did he access, for example? Um, he accessed the Yellow Ribbon program, so that was one that I heard. Also, the v all the VA programs, I didn't know about them when I came home. He does. so, And he had all the information because he had an educated family who knew what was happening, knew mm -hmm. what he was going through, knew what to look for, and where to send them. Very good. Mike? Well, and, and I think one of the things that was just brought up um, is the other side of a very positive coin, meaning that there are lots of programs out there now positioned to help, but one of the things you hear from veterans and military families over and over again is there's so much out there, they become overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. There's so many programs, there's so much information that it really becomes a challenge um, trying to identify what the right channel of support is for their particular issue, their particular mm -hmm. problem. Catherine, in, in terms of substance use disorder and mental health issues, behavioral health issues, what, what is important for families to know and, and how can they help the service member? Obviously, Jen experienced mm -hmm. it and she's not an isolated mm -hmm. case. Well, I think that the most important thing is for people to, as Barbara suggested, to get educated and to get smart. And frankly, um, most people, whether they're civilian or military, are not that well educated about what behavioral health conditions look like. In other words, what are the signs and symptoms of someone who may have a substance abuse uh, or addiction or uh, a disorder? What are the signs and symptoms of someone who uh, has a mental illness or who ha may have a mental health problem? And frankly, that's one of the things that the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration is pushing is that we really want people to become more knowledgeable about that through programs like Mental Health First Aid, which is a wonderful um, Red Cross-like uh, training program in about two or three days in which you become smart about what behavioral health conditions look like in humans and how they manifest themselves. And where so is this program manifested? Where is it offered? It's available through the National Council of Community Behavioral Health Care. You can get training in it across your communities. They can get information about it from SAMHSA. And so mental health first aid is the first thing because we're not taught growing up how to pay attention to our emotional health and our emotional well-being. We're taught about what to do about our physical health, a headache, a broken bone, but not about our emotions. So the first thing is that families, particularly families with military uh, members, I think need to become more educated about what are those signs and, and symptoms that Barbara referred to. And then I think there are particular uh, emotional clues 
the touch points, uh, so how they're behaving socially, um, how are they are they going back and getting an education? Are they looking to where are they going to work? Are, are they being connected with peers? Because a lot of times that individuals who have behavioral disorders, a substance abuse problem or a mental health problem, will be referred to by peers. In other words, it'll be a friend who will say, "Don't you know that you really don't want to hurt yourself?" or what do you mean you're thinking about hurting yourself or are you thinking about um, doing something that's dangerous and, and putting yourself in harm's way? It's a friend or a peer that often helps that individual get connected to the supports and services that are needed. And so the, just being aware of those signs and symptoms and being educated about and be willing to talk to people about suicide. Yeah. Be willing to talk to people. I was just going to gonna bring that point up exactly. I mean, it, I mean we're looking at Taking it away from the issue of the military, even the National Football League, some of the me members of the National mm -hmm. Football League, you're seeing incidents of suicide right. from traumatic brain injury. And this mm -hmm. is something that the servicemen and women suffer constantly. Right. And, and so how does one, um, in a family environment, uh, look out for that particular person. I mean, they may have been assessed, as I, and I go back to it. Uh, the Mike has mentioned, everyone has mentioned, there's tons of programs that can assess, that can identify. But what does the immediate family need to be very sensitive to in terms of that military uh, member? Well, I think that Jen referred to the isolation. So I think family members really need to pay attention and, and be of assistance as possible whenever necessary to be sure and make sure that people are not isolated, they're not separate, they're not alone, that they have uh, some sort of social support, that they have some activities to do. People want to be reconnected to something. It's that mm -hmm. loss of Even the Even though they may be putting uh, everyone that's, at arm's that's way. That's right. And that's when you have to be able to say to people, I understand, I'm trying to empathize with why you're disconnecting, but, but because we love you, we want you to be reconnected with us. Yeah. And when we come back, I want to be able to continue this topic because I think this is very important that the public understand the dynamic of what is going on. We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Every day, I seek a positive direction for my life. Through my accomplishments. And now, with help. And support from my family and others, I own. I own. I own my recovery from addiction and depression. Join the Voices for Recovery. It's worth it. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. They say a service member commits suicide approximately every day, once a day. At Maryland's Commitment to Veterans, we are navigators. Our focus is mental health and substance abuse treatment services to ensure that veterans and their families are accessing those services who reach out to our program. But we're really here to ensure that veterans and their families are accessing the benefits that they're entitled to. We're also here to um, connect them with not only federal resources and state resources, but also with their communities. I went to church and I was going to make my peace with God and I had a, um, a, a bullet that was sitting home that I was going to use when I got back. I'd lost my family and um, thought I was going crazy. I still saw people I lost and this one guy, he was, he just kept talking to me. And he, um, he says, you got PTSD and you got it bad. He says, there's someone you need to talk to. I'm glad you're doing that. I think that would be nice for you to have. My son Jason had, you know, after 9-11, felt like he needed to go, serve his country, went over. He came back from there. He started gambling or uh, started to use recreational drugs. And thank goodness, 
I got Ariana Day's uh, name and her program was just phenomenal. You would call the 800 number that we have listed and you'll reach a live person. I'm thinking that maybe a housing voucher, you know, applying for that is going to be probably a good option for you. And then they're going to direct your call to our program and really listen to what the needs are, the challenges are with that veteran or family. I've had difficulties in the fact that I have nightmares. And so in that situation of having those nightmares and having those flashbacks, um, it was very difficult for for the reunion. Family members are, you know, really impacted because they really sacrifice a lot while their spouse is, is in theater. You know, they're taking on a number of different roles. And so when their spouse returns, it's it can be even more challenging. They come back and they're they're in this heightened state of awareness and they're, you know, their adrenaline is rushing and now they're supposed to come back and just flow into everyday life. In situations where we need to expedite something for a veteran to get VA health care services, we're able to really get those needs met timely. In the case of the veterans program, we do a lot of transportation to mental health appointments and we'll try and get the vet to the place that they need to be while um, Ariana is, is, is arranging for, for either intake at a specialized treatment center or some temporary. If programs like this were not available, everybody, families, would be struggling on their own, not knowing what resources were out there. My father served in the military and um, it was his career. And so for me, the military has always been a second family. In working with this program, it was just a great opportunity for me to show my appreciation for the life that I was given as a child of the military. They're not here to coddle you, but they're here to let you know um, we can help you get you the resources wherein we can help you move forward. So Mike, you wanted to add a little bit after Catherine noted um, the issues with the suicide uh, concerns? Just to put some context into the, the conversation so everyone understands. So veterans represent approximately 6% of the U.S. population, but they represent 20% of all the suicides in this country. So you know, clearly the discussion that we're having is, is very important. Um, the, and I think as we talk about community and the extent to which we can address some of these ideas around isolation with the support of the community, I think it, it, there's also another challenge here in that the community didn't go to war. You know, 1% of the country went to war. And the Pew Research Group released a study uh, just a couple months ago where they actually surveyed Americans and um, ask them questions about the extent to which this past decade of war has, has impacted their lives in any meaningful way. And the majority of Americans um, responded, really, a decade of war hasn't impacted me at all. And further, you know, upwards of 80 percent of Americans said that they really don't understand the issues and challenges facing the community of veterans. So I think as we talk about addressing issues like suicide and the extent to which we need to educate the family, um, it's critical that we also broaden that focus with regard to educating all of America with, with regard to the issues facing this community so that there really can be that broad-based community support. I think there is this issue relative to the discussion of suicide that I had mentioned that is important and I think it's the difficulty, the discrimination and the myths about the way in which you have to engage to talk about suicide is one thing we have to overcome. And that's particularly true in the military because of the warrior culture. And the military itself is shifting their own mm -hmm. philosophy and values and saying it's acceptable to talk now about the fact that you might be considering suicide. You have to understand that that may be going on in the military. And the great thing about the fact that, that military members become depressed, also think about suicide, which is a normative experience in many ways, that what is available is 1-800-273-TALK, which is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And when anyone calls that number, if they are a veteran or want to be connected with a veteran, they hit the number one and they're immediately connected to Conodago, New York and the host of 
trained counselors on the phone. So we're able to get people connected immediately and walk them through the crisis. And I think having those kinds of resources available and that the community knows about is one way to combat the issue. And Barbara, you were noting before during the break that essentially it's not just about the, the service man or woman. It really goes beyond that. It extends into the family in terms of the, the, the threats uh, that suicide poses. Well, our families have, have been under stress for at 10 years of war and plus. And what research has been showing is that our families are having increased um, need and request for mental health services, also seeing an increase in alcohol and drug abuse, um, especially when the service member is deployed. And so as um, our study found that depending upon how well the communication was going on between the non-deployed spouse and the children dictated as far as how well the household did, but also how well the children did. And if the non-deployed spouse was experiencing any sort of mental health issues, that in itself increased issues um, within the children. They have not been tracking as far as what's happening as far as with our families. Are our suicide rates up as far as with our spouses and with our children? Are our attempts up with those particular population as well? We appreciate the fact that there's a lot of focus on our um, service members, our guard and reserve, and our veterans, but also too, our families have been under a tremendous amount of stress they too are experiencing issues. There's still stigma that exists as far as with them. They're afraid as far as to come forward to mention that they themselves are having issues because what's the impact now on the service member, the guardsman, the reservist? And so they're reluctant as far as to come forward. And we hear stories constantly as far as when they do come forward, sometimes situations happen that, that they did not necessarily want um, to have happen. So there is an issue. There's also as far as looking to see how the mental health of our providers are doing. You know, they've also been forward deployed, seeing all the injuries in battlefield. Then they come back and they're deployed. I mean, now they're assigned to our military treatment facilities at Walter Reed Bethesda or um, down at BMC as far as Brooke. And how are they doing? Are they ha have they had opportunities as far as to reintegrate with their families? Have they had the right amount of dwell time? And now they're back taking care of the same service members or guardmen and reservists that they um, took care of in theater. And they're still having all the stresses as far as with their job and not necessarily had time to come down as far as being in theater. And th that's who our families are going to. I mean, we're more likely, um, research has shown in the civilian sector and this research that just came out with the, um, what do you call it, the medical surveillance monthly report showing that basically provider, I mean, you've gone in to see a provider, a healthcare provider, you know, within the first 30 to 60 days before you've either attempted or, or, um, or actually completed suicide. So as we're looking at that particular piece, we need to make sure that our providers are healthy so that when we do come in to see them, that they are assessing us for how we're doing for our mental health. Jen, I want to go back to Give an Hour. Talk a little bit about that program and what it tries to do. Sure. Give an Hour is a national nonprofit, and we provide free mental health care to post 9 11 veterans, their families, and the communities. So it's anybody that's been impacted by the current conflicts overseas. What happens is they can come to our website and they search our provider database and they can find somebody who's willing to donate therapy to them. So and we have, I mean, we have psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, RNs, LPNs. We have a whole entire gamut of people who are willing to donate their services to try to help out our military families and communities. Well, that's very honorable. Um, Catherine, along with that, the president has made the services to military families a priority. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about what SAMHSA is specifically doing under the strategic initiative. Part of the president's initiative included pulling together the 16 cabinet secretaries to create a report called Strengthening Military Families. And SAMHSA represented HHS, the Department of Health and Human Services, in that group. And our SAMHSA initiative is really derivative of that report and that report's focus. And in that report, there was a, um, a goal. The first goal was to strengthen the psychological health of s military service members, veterans, and their families. And so the Department of Health and Human Services uh, as, a part, as a partner, basically, with the VA and with the Department of Defense, 
pledges to do whatever it can to support the psychological health of this population. So SAMHSA has taken on the military service members, veterans and their families as an initiative to focus specifically on the behavioral health issues for this population and to ensure that any individual who needs it has access to appropriate behavioral health services and those services are what are considered to be evidence-based practices that are focused on recovery. And includes the Center for Trauma? That's correct. And we have we have a variety of resources within SAMHSA. We have a trauma initiative. We have um, the Center for Trauma-Informed Care. We have um, a focus on uh, making sure that what we call recovery-oriented services are available through our community providers and through the states. So SAMHSA is not um, getting in the way of either VA or DOD doing their appropriate mission, but we are partners with them in the sense that both state authorities in behavioral health and community service agencies are understanding this population. And so our role is to, is to certainly um, educate uh, our partners in cultural competence of what it means to be in the military and get those individuals like the folks that Jen works with in terms of the professionals understanding what it means to be uh, in the military and in the military culture and in the military environment and seeing themselves as partners so that if an individual chose not to use either um, VA services or other services, we would make sure that they were aware of those services, but that our community providers would also be available to provide behavioral health, particularly focused on substance abuse disorders, addictions, and mental illnesses. And that happens quite often. You find a lot of military and veteran personnel who don't want to go to the federal agencies. They don't want to go to the VA because we're afraid of that uh, the stigma. Conf the stigma that, I think that Barbara was absolutely talking about. the 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 stigma. We're warriors. We're soldiers. We're supposed to be able to handle everything. That's the mentality that you know we had instilled in us. But not only that, but it's the confidentiality thing as well. We don't get that when it goes on our permanent record. So by by being able to go to these outside community resources where everything is confidential. It will never get back to my military community or my veteran community. I feel safer in going and talking to them. So some vets and military personnel choose to do that. And I think that's what I find very novel about that, that program. And when we come back, we will be continuing our chat about the resources available to help our military men and women. We'll be right back. Before, addiction and depression kept me from living my life. And now, every step I take in recovery benefits everyone. There are many options that make the road to recovery more accessible. It begins with the first step. Join the Voices for Recovery. For information and treatment referral for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. DAV's mission is simply to build better lives for disabled veterans and their families. We are known for uh, helping veterans with their claims for veterans' benefits. What do you need assistance with today? Well, I'm looking to check on my claim for my PTSD. About 2 in 10 have PTSD, a little bit more for major depression, and it goes up from there. In fact, bipolar is roughly 3 in 10. Your IU claim, your IU claim is a new claim, it's just been issued two weeks ago. We first look for their physical disabilities and many times a physical disability is the cause of a mental disability. All I had to do was sit home you know, and try and recuperate and I, I, I went into a depression.
Once we can get them treatment for the mental disorder, then we can control their substance abuse. And that's what we look for when we tell them to seek treatment at a VA facility. Since all of DAV's National Service Officers are disabled veterans, we have a connection with the veteran that sits across the table with us, and we're able to get them to relax a little bit more and give us a little bit more information about their mental health conditions and the symptoms that they have with it and how they're treating those symptoms. So, oh, Mr. Stater, how can I help you today? When a veteran comes in and, and they've got this barrier up about their mental health, they don't want to get treatment, they don't want that stigma, I always look at them and I ask them, if you had a broken leg, and the bone sticking out of your out of the skin, would you sit here and say, oh, it'll be all right, everything's going to get better, or would you go to the hospital and get treatment? Families are the backbone of the military. You know, a lot of veterans who come home who have mental health conditions don't realize it. The spouses and the children are the first to realize that they're, they're a changed person. A spouse can come to us and say, my husband has these symptoms, what should I do? Are you currently getting treatment? Yes. yes. If a veteran doesn't seek proper mental health treatment for their uh, mental health or their substance abuse, uh, worst case scenario is death. We start using to escape, escape things that you don't want to think about. It. All of a sudden you're back here and you got nothing but time to think. And the last thing you want to do is think about it. They can go to the VA, it's free, and it's unlimited. I've seen veterans who came back, they had everything going for them, but they didn't get treatment and the next time I saw them, they were living in their sister's basement. No job, no money, no wife. Take the earlier effective date, an IU claim, and we'll see where we can go from that. So what we do is try to identify what type of mental disorder they have. Once we get to identify it, then we send them to the necessary places, VA medical centers, to get the diagnosis, and then we help them with their claim to establish benefits for mental disorders counselor out there said that it's not actually a light at the end of the tunnel it's a candle in the middle of the tunnel and you gotta go get this pick up that little light and keep going because that's not the end. Barbara I heard you um, wanted to make a comment at the end of the last panel. I did. So SAMHSA is doing a wonderful job through their state policy academies as far as educating providers along with military um, one source about military culture and so our association has been asking for let's make sure that we have um, either a, um, a CEU that's out there for providers to go and take on military culture and actually the Department of Defense has created one but also making sure that a curriculum gets built within all the schools that um, offer um, courses for behavioral health providers or even for our family practice doctors so they understand what military culture is and so that's within their practice from, from then on. But SAMHSA has a wonderful state policy academy not only as far as educating about the military being out there but the states themselves getting together talking about ways in which they can make things better for the military. Of the state policy academies we've had three and 23 states have been through them already and so each of those states now has a strategic plan on how they are going to address the behavioral health needs of the returning veteran and military service member population. And, and we find that the state leadership then gets connected with their adjutant general, they get connected with uh, um, uh, Given Hour, they get connected with Yellow Ribbon, they get connected with all of the sort of state resources that are in that particular state. And then it gets to be a much more collaborative approach. And you hopefully you know have a much more focused attention. And so we're looking forward to doing another policy mm. academy in September for another 10 states. So. Excellent. We're really excited. Mike, I want to go back to you. Um, we've been talking about uh, utopia in, in terms of what is working. Talk to us about where the systems still need to be improved. You know, you kicked off, the, you kicked off this, this, uh, this panel by asking the question, why is this important? You know, and I think that's another question that um, we intuitively come to the conclusion that it's important because we need we have a debt to repay to the and, and all that stuff is absolutely true but you know this is we are uh, we're only a couple decades into an experiment uh, with an all-volunteer military in this country and you know I truly believe that if we fail this generation of veterans that experiment with an all-volunteer military will fail as well and we talk about being out in the community, we talk about understanding and, and, and all of these. You know, for me, I guess, 
as somebody who um, spends the majority of my time running programs for veterans, working with this generation of veterans, I am not convinced that, um, sometimes I wonder if, we're, if uh, we're preaching to the choir, you know, the people that are showing up at these meetings and conferences are, are the ones who already understand. Um, because I am not convinced that the br there is broad understanding among citizens as to um, the, the issues and challenges impacting this community. And I think until we get there, um, we're, it will be an uphill battle. And Catherine, also that augurs for more coordination of services, which you were specifically addressing so that the state, the local municipality, the national programs mm -hmm. begin to really understand what resources are available and we can maximize. That's correct. And I think one of the things that we've found um, is that for too long, they were closed systems. DOD had a closed system, the VA had a closed system, and then there was the rest of the healthcare system in the world. And what we're, what we're absolutely discovering is that they cannot do it alone. They should not do it alone. Those closed systems have to open their doors and windows. They have to have partnerships in the community. They, we cannot have replicated systems in silos, no more. And I think that we have to encourage leadership, frankly, in DOD and VA, and we have to encourage uh, leadership across the federal government, leadership in the states, leadership at the local level to make sure that those kinds of collaborations and the level of coordination that's necessary to help be more directive about what's available is the most important thing we can do. I think we, we have to encourage the civilian community to, to understand more, to understand better, um, but that's really done by a factor of using the bully pulpit of not only the president, but also the secretaries of health um, and even the secretary of defense coming forward and saying, you know, I, uh, you know, speaking to particularly non-traditional, non-military groups about the, wh what's going the on. I mean, I it, it you know, it, it, as an example to illustrate this point, you can look at um, vets in higher education today. So um, this generation of veterans has access to the post 9-11 GI Bill, which is the most generous educational benefit that's been afforded to this community since the um, GI Bill after World War II. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing um, exceptionally high dropout rates mm -hmm. of veterans in higher education. Um, depending on which study or who you listen to, it's anywhere between 50 and 70 percent. Are not our our starting school and then Why dropping out. Why do you out. think that is happening? Well, we actually we did a study and we actually reached out and surveyed large numbers of student veterans and w uh, we asked them questions about what do you perceive as the impediments to your educational success, and in at the top of the list was I don't feel like I fit in on this college campus. I don't feel like my student peers understand my unique situation. I don't feel like faculty administrators understand my unique situation. And that's, that's the kind of understanding I think you need, we need to get to in order to really move the needle and, and, and deal with some of these issues. Barbara, I'm going to go to you and ask you if you had a magic wand, I asked you prior to starting the show, what do you think would be the priority in terms of what needs to change and improve, or what do we need to continue to do in order to provide better services? We need to make sure that we're continuing to build resilience in our military families so that they can handle whatever comes their way. I always use the terminology, focus upstream. In other words, let's care for them while they're still on active duty. Um, um, and now give them the tools that they need in order to be able to survive, uh, not only as far as access to good family support programs, but also to make sure that they have access to education and a portable um, job, so that no, no matter what comes their way, so if there's an injury or an illness, the family's able to, to, to handle all of that. What keeps me up at night, though, is what is the long-term impact of this war? We have no idea. I mean, the high percentage of our um, veterans with traumatic brain injury that have been experienced through um, their time in, in theater, 
what are the long-term impacts for that as far as the high percentage of post-traumatic stress? You know, what's the impact on that as well? But what about our children? I mean, who's going to care for them when they're adults and they're not in the military? It's going to be the communities that are going to be out there as far as for us. What about the parents or what about the spouse who's now so divorced? So it's the entire family. Right. Very, so it's very, really very looking good at, point. at reintegration and making sure that our communities are also aware of, of, of the support and are also providing um, support um, for us. Jen. Um, I personally think it's all about community collaboration. I, we talked about, you know, the schools and how students don't feel like they fit in there. Well, if we have SVOs, if we have the student veterans organizations available, if we have an educated faculty as well as educated students, you're going to have these people who are going to be able to continue their education and do the things they need to do with and their find lives. The support. Absolutely. And, you know, that's a big, big missing piece right now. Catherine. I think as we continue to strengthen our families and we are out in the civilian communities more and more, I think that's a big part of this educative process. I also think that um, uh, this, is a, this is a promise. We've made a promise to this generation and we need to do everything we can. I want to see more employers uh, willing to open up their employee ranks to veterans and to make whatever kinds of um, uh, employment arrangements are necessary in order to use the skills of this very skilled workforce and think broadly about how to bring them back into work. If people work and they feel a sense of belonging, um, I think that's mm -hmm. our promise to them and we have to do that and it's the civilian community that has to do that. It's not the military yeah. community. Mike. For me, it's about education. I think at the end of the day, um, in the in the scope of issues that that we're dealing with in the context of this community, I think education is is well positioned to advance the post service life course of this nation's veterans. There's a there's a window of opportunity with the current um, post 9/11 GI Bill, but we haven't done a great job implementing that. And I'm, I'm talking about both government and institutions of higher education. You know, right now, for example, um, eight of the top 10 recipients as institutions of GI Bill money last year were um, online for-profit universities that have a dropout rate of higher than 65%. So and they're not held accountable. We need, to, we need to hold them accountable. I want to remind our audience that September is National Recovery Month. We want to encourage you to go online at www.recoverymonth.gov and find all of the wonderful materials so everyone can get engaged and during September also support uh, military families and vets in their struggle to come back, be reintegrated into society and get the necessary help that they need and they deserve. It's been a great show. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.